can I show you something real quick? We had a female bass player, a female drummer. We're working it. We're going to have an all-girl band soon. Watch out. I'm ready for it. But today, I want to talk about, um, we've talked about a lot of things. Uh, we talked about how we need to let go and let God in this series, and what does that mean, how to step out of God's way. And, and uh, Pastor Steve talked about taming your tongue, controlling your tongue, controlling what comes out of your mouth. In this series, too, we threw something in there, we, like I said, the week before. And last week, we talked about spiritual maturity. And today, I want to talk about self control. And the problem with self-control is that I've watched people say, well, at the end of the day, you can't control yourself. Only God can control things. Only God has complete sovereignty over it all. But then I've heard a lot of parents and leaders in my life tell me, hey, get yourself together. Control yourself. Not yourself, yourself. All right. And, but the problem is, am I in control or am I not in control? How, How does this thing work? And in fact, the Bible actually says that there's something called fruits of the Spirit. And uh, if you're new here today, what that basically means is this, that, that, that if I'm hanging out with God, if I'm, and if I have a relationship with God, if I have union with God, then I'm going to bear a certain type of fruit in my life. And, and we're going to read about what that means. But, but one of them, the last one, actually says it's self-control. But yet, I don't have real control over my life, so how the heck do I have self-control? How the heck do I change the things that I want to change in my life? Because if we're honest, some of us really have a hard time changing our habits, changing our emotions. If you're like me, change your face, right? I have a hard time changing my face sometimes. I was born this way. Literally, when I was a baby, this was my face. Same level of hair and everything. This this is what it was. I even had a little beard because I'm Puerto Rican. We just come out that way. But, but we, have this, we, we have to change certain things. So how do we change certain things even though I'm not in control? I shared um, a few years ago, I shared that I had an addiction in my life, even as a pastor. And you're laughing, but it's just true. I had an addiction of Pop-Tarts. Any Pop-Tart fans in the house? Right? The frosted ones, though. Don't give me that crap that is when it's not frosted. That's not even a Pop-Tart, Right? And, uh, and I remember my wife, um, she would buy these s'mores Pop-Tarts, which is the best ones, by the way. Second is the cinnamon ones, but, but the s'mores Pop-Tarts. And she would buy a box, and, and, uh, and as a pastor, my day off, I usually designate, believe it or not, we do work the rest of the week. Y'all know this? Um, and my day off, I declared it was Monday. And at this time, my, my wife was, that's my mother, what a slip. My wife was working in the mortgage field. And so she would go, and I would work from home on Mondays. And, and um, those Pop-Tarts were calling my name. And, uh, and I have a process. So when you take a Pop-Tart, for me personally, I eat the crust first. Anybody out there? Eat the crust first, and then you eat the rest of it, right? I had this process, so it was, uh, I enjoyed it. I savored it, and, and one day, I just, I just, I'm just going to eat one, one pack. It's just, just one pack, and I, and I ate it, and I was like, mm, I, wonder how, I wonder how these taste toasted, because the first one, I didn't take the time to toast it, so I opened up another pack, and then I, and I toasted it, and I was like, mm, all right, that's kind of cool, but man, I'm still kind of hungry, because I ate them so quickly, and at the end of the day, I ate the whole entire box, right? Wifey comes home. This is a true story. I'm not even making this up for the sake of this sermon. Uh, she comes home. She goes, I can't believe that these boys ate the entire box of Pop-Tarts already, right? And I didn't want to lie to her, so I just said, yeah, these boys. So she went grocery shopping again. She bought another box. And, and it started whispering to me on the next Monday. And I did the same exact thing again. I ate the whole entire box. And, and, she, and then she came to me. She goes, man, I can't believe it. She goes, who's eating these? And all the, bo- the, you know, the boys, they get all, you know, like when you get yelled at, you didn't do anything, but you still feel guilty. That was the face that they had. Who's eating all these Pop-Tarts? And I was like, at this point, I couldn't lie. And I was like, it was me. I ate all the Pop-Tarts. And she goes, all right, I'm not buying any more Pop-Tarts. You have an issue. So she, that was the last day that our family bought Pop-Tarts. True story. Last day. And a couple years ago, I shared this, and Peter, one of the attendees here, on Christmas, he got me this big old box. 
of Pop Tarts. And if I'm lying, the way he wrapped it, it almost looked like a, a wine bottle uh, box. So I'm thinking, oh, he got me wine, but no, it was stacked up Pop Tarts. So I ate them secretly in my office. And, um, <laughs> But what did I have to do? I had to tell my wife, stop buying the Pop-Tarts. I don't, I don't have control over these things. These things talk to me. They cry out to me. They, they, and they're so, so good. And, and so what I had to do, I had to release control because I didn't have self-control in order for me to get to a place of self-control. Do you understand what I'm talking about? And so with understanding self-control in your life, we have to understand that, that this is something that God does want in our lives because it is a fruit of the Spirit. If you don't believe me, this is what the Bible says in Galatians chapter five. And I'm gonna read from the message version first and then I'm gonna read from the regular version. And it says this, but what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others. So, so the more I spend time with God, this is what happens. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, to not quit. A sense of compassion in the heart, a conviction that that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. This is the byproduct of hanging out with God. Legalism is helpless in bringing this about. So in other words, like you just telling yourself, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, isn't gonna help. It only gets in the way among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good, crucified. Our lives are a byproduct of his power, not my power. Can I say that again? Our lives are a byproduct of his power, not my power. And this is how it reads in the regular version in Galatians 5, 22. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love Joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Against such things, there is no law. Who wants more joy in your life? Come on. Who wants more joy in their life? Half of y'all. Who wants more peace in your life? Who wants to be more patient? who wants to be kind, who wants to have goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and, and self-control in our life. All of us want these things. And the problem is we cannot produce it on our own. We just can't. And I love the line that says there is no law, meaning this, that there's no, there, there's no need for rules when everything is right. And we get this stuff not by our own power, not by our own will, but by being tethered to the Spirit of God. That's the only way to do this. In the beginning of this series, we talked about how the definition of control is this. It's the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. When you read that definition, I'm like, uh, I'm never, ever in control. Things happen. And again, we, we discussed in this series that I'm not in control of what, the way people treat me, but I am in control of the way I respond to it. I am, I am in control in decisions. The first gift that God ever gave us was decision making. Can I say that again? The first gift that God ever gave us was decision making. If you've been to church, he gave us free will, the ability to choose him. Why? Because there is no love without choice. We have to have the ability to choose someone in order for it to be real love. So he gave us that. So now we have this thing happening inside of each and every one of us. Paul even said it, the Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, he goes, why do I do what I don't want to do and don't do what I do want to do? There's this struggle, there's this battle every single morning. Do you eat the Pop-Tarts or do you leave them alone for the rest of the kids? Do you say that thing that you really want to say or do you abide by Scripture and says a soft answer turns away wrath? Come on. Do you, do you pout and do you whine or do you complain or do you patiently approach life waiting for something good to happen? You have these choices every single day. And the Bible says this, that he puts before us life and death. And then he gives us a cheat sheet. He says, now choose life. We have these choices that we have. And he's never going to take away our choice. But ultimately, we're out of control. So how the heck do I have self-control? How the heck do I bear the fruit of self-control? Because I want to change these things, but it's hard. All right, so here's three concepts this morning about bearing the fruit of self-control. Who's ready this morning? You told me you're ready. Don't front. Don't lie. You're in church. Number one, you ready? 
Fruit of, fruit of self-control, ready for this one? It's a byproduct, not a decision. Write that down. It is a byproduct, not a decision. You need a decision to set you up for this, but it is a byproduct. That's why when we talk about it's a fruit, it's a byproduct. It is a result. In other words, I can't just decide to have self-control. Self-control is a byproduct of me deciding to be with God, of me deciding to walk with God. It is a byproduct. I can't just make it happen. That's like me deciding I want six-pack abs. I can't decide that, right? Six-pack abs is a what? It's a byproduct. It's a byproduct of what? Not eating Pop-Tarts, right? I can't decide to have that in the same way with all those fruits of the Spirit. I can't just decide to have joy. I can't just decide to have patience. Why? Because it is a fruit of the Spirit. So my decision is the Holy Spirit. My decision is God. And then the byproduct of that, come on, somebody, is self-control. So what I have to do is a series of little decisions that produce that result. And again, it's a decision, and we cannot take away from that decision because, because again, it, a person without decision is a slave. A person with no decision-making power is a slave. And I know the Bible says that we're a slave to Christ, but there's freedom in this, okay? We're no longer slaves is the song that we used to sing, right? We're no longer slaves in this. We're, we're children of God. We're children of the Most High. We're free. And the Bible says that Jesus came to set the captives free. And whoever the Son of God has set free is free through and through. And so since we're free, we have this ability to choose. So what decisions, so write these down between you and God. What decisions do you need to make, not necessarily to produce self-control, but to get yourself to a place in proximity where you could bear the fruit of self-control? Do you understand what I'm saying today? And what stops us from having self-control is kind of funny. It's our selfishness. Because... If you're anything like me, I, I, I battled with my pride in a way that I never wanted to ask for help. Anybody here? And I believe that's deep-rooted in selfishness and pride when you don't want to ask for help. And in fact, maybe you don't even like this point because you're just like, well, no, of course you could self-control. You could will yourself to do something. You could, you could will yourself to have those six-pack abs. You could will yourself to change. You could will yourself to freedom, and to be honest with you, no, you cannot because we're imperfect. And, and I watch people go, well, I'm, I'm just gonna make this happen, and, and if we do make it happen, it's only temporary. In order for a permanent work to happen, we need to have eternal power. In order for a permanent work to happen, we need to have eternal power. But the problem is we have temporary power. We have very flaky power. So anything that we put together on our own accord, our own power, is only going to be temporary at best. Y'all following me here today? So it's these decisions that you make, but sometimes when we struggle with asking for help, it's because we think, well, no, I, this needs to be from me. I need to produce this. I'm a man. I should be able to do this on my own without asking for help. And to, can I be really honest with you? Actually, not asking for help is weaker than anyone that, that does ask for help. And what's stopping you from asking for help is just straight up pride and selfishness. And in order for us to really live by the Spirit, we have to sow into the Spirit. Really, go back to Galatians 6. So we read in Galatians 5 about this whole concept of self-control. But what do, this is what Galatians 6, 7, and 8 says. Because do not be conceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows that he also reap. For the one who sows in his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Y'all getting this? So selfishness will never ask for help because it, it, it might be asked to, to, to serve you. You know, people who are addicted to, to asking for help, sometimes it's not really help. They're just saying, just serve me in this moment. But real help means this, that you're actually giving up control to someone else to help you. It's like me giving up control to my wife to say, don't buy those Pop-Tarts anymore, all right? It's giving up that control. And so this byproduct is set up by little decisions along the way. Number two, self-control, and you gotta pay attention to this one, this is important. Self-control isn't being controlled by self rather than releasing the control of self. I'm gonna say that again and let it marinate. Self-control isn't being controlled by self 
rather than releasing the control of self. This is where I struggle with this because when I heard the term self-control, I'm thinking, okay, so now I have to control myself, right? I have to put this, I have to do this in my own power, but that's not the case at all. It's actually releasing the control of self. There is a duality inside each and every one of us. If you ever think you're schizophrenic or there's multiple voices going on in your head, join the club. There's a duality to every single one of us. We, we all have this tug of war, this battle. Every single morning when we wake up, we have to have a choice. Am I going to listen to this little angel on this shoulder or am I going to listen to uh, the not-so-angel on the other shoulder, right? I'm not going to say he's a devil because I don't believe anyone here has a devil inside of them, but... We have this duality to us, right? You have this, this person that, that wants to live right and the person that just wants to live for me. The person that wants to live for me. And, and so with this duality, every single morning we have this choice. Which one am I going to listen to today? And this is where you have to kind of preach to yourself and wake up in the morning and say, okay, today I'm going to serve outside of myself. I'm not going to serve myself. I'm going to serve outside of myself. I'm going to listen to the Holy Spirit. I'm actually, in order to listen to the Holy Spirit, ready? You have to actually first consider the Holy Spirit. When was the last time, honestly, and we serve a culture, a church culture, where we say we pray, but we really don't? Can we be honest? You ever said that to somebody? Real talk. You ever said, yeah, I'll pray for you, and you never do? You scared to say that right now? It's okay. Right? We, we, again, this duality. We just, we, there's one part of us that wants to do good, and the other part of us that just wants to be selfish. So what is this self? And, and the self that we have to crucify, the self that we have to lay down, it's this self that we have to battle. And, and one might call it the soul. So, and if you receive bad teaching in regards to this, um, kind of don't, don't allow those filters to interfere with what I'm about to say. Your soul, your self, is your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's your mind, your will, and your emotions. Sometimes my mind's not right. Sometimes my will's not right. Sometimes my emotions aren't accurate. Again, you can feel lonely even in a crowded room here today, aren't you? And so we, in order to, to battle oneself, you can't listen to yourself. So this is releasing the control of self. That's what true self-control is. The Bible says in Proverbs 25, 28, it says this. It says, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. The disaster that happens when you lack self-control is that severe. And the reason, and contextually, if it was a, a city of value, if it was a city of worth, there'd be a wall around it protecting it from the attacks of the enemy. But the Bible says that, that a person who lacks self-control is exactly that. It's like a city that's been torn down without any defenses. A person without self-control is vulnerable to even more attacks in their lives. That's the importance of having self-control. And we hear all the time that, in regards to fear, right, 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and what does that say? And self-control. So we got to understand that this is a gift that God wants from us, but it isn't us self-controlling the self. It's us releasing the control of self. And here's how we do it, number three. And I'm going to close with this point. This is really good. Good accountability cannot exist without authority given in a relationship. Write that down, but I'm going to explain it, okay? This might not preach really well, but this is good context and good practical stuff. Good accountability cannot exist without authority given in a relationship. In other words, um, try to teach people that accountability, when you want to change something, whether it be Pop-Tarts or maybe way more severe, maybe it's alcoholism, maybe it's drugs, maybe it's pornography, maybe it's um, affairs, whatever it is, if you're trying to break away from something, you need accountability. Why? Because the Bible says it is not good for a man or a woman to do anything alone. Even if you have God, he still has ordained relationships in your life to hold you accountable. And I like to tell people all the time, accountability isn't babysitting. Can I get an amen on that? Accountability isn't babysitting. Here's what accountability is. It's you giving another person that you have relationship with authority to call you on your crap. That is, uh, that is accountability. And honestly, that is the only way. If it's a severe change, that's the only way you're going to do this. Pastor Max is starting Recovery Church this week. Give it up for him. He loves attention. And one of the things that 
we, we can't, a lot, some people in the church kind of discredit the whole 12-step thing, and I don't care if you agree with the 12 steps or not, but this is one thing that we could actually value about the 12 steps. And by the way, they're, they're coming up to like a century of those 12 steps working in people's lives. And so we, we have to look at it and study it and see, wow, there's something good in that. But here's the first thing that they acknowledge. The first thing that they acknowledge is that they cannot control one's alcoholism. They're completely powerless over their alcoholism, okay? You cannot break free from something without confession. You cannot break free from something without confession. I've tried. I've tried to deal things in the secret and wonder if I could break free from it. But without the power of confession, we can't break free from it. Even it doesn't even have to be so severe as alcoholism or drug addiction. Here's the cool part. When I'm helping somebody function and process their insecurity, the minute they say, I'm insecure, is the minute they actually start breaking free from it. Right? It's the person that doesn't want to admit that they're insecure, that they seem even more insecure. Am I right or wrong? Right? But the minute they confess, I'm insecure, all of a sudden they step closer to a place of confidence in their lives. And it's the same thing. Without confession, you can't break free from anything. But here, the 12 steps says admitting that one cannot control the alcoholism, the addiction, the compulsion. They can't control it. And then the second step is this, recognizing a higher power that gives strength. Thank God, thank Jesus that we understand who the higher power is here at Fervent Church. And in order for you to change, you have to understand that, that in order for us to embrace wisdom and embrace accountability, I have to be first in a relationship. I can't just tell a stranger to hold me accountable. I have to be in relationship and then give that person authority in that relationship. That's good accountability. We think just being in community honestly isn't enough because I could be in community and still be a liar. Is that too real for y'all this morning? I could be in community and still be a liar. And so what we have to do is we have to give up that authority in our lives and say, hey, honestly, I can't have the keys anymore. I, I, I can't drive this thing anymore. I have to give away the authority. And again, that is not weak. That is the beginning of strength. That is not weak. That is the beginning of strength. And if you want to change anything in your life, if you really want to bear the fruit of accountability, then you have to give up your authority. You have to, the first decision you have to make is to surrender the authority to the people around you and ultimately to God. So when you read scripture, don't just read scripture just to read scripture. Read scripture and say, I'm giving up authority to the word of truth in my life. Can I get an amen this morning? Right? When you get into worship, when you get into God's presence, don't just get into God's presence to feel the goosebumps, but to get into God's presence to remind yourself that I'm surrendering my authority to the only one that should have authority in my life, and that's Jesus. Again, my heart is not a couch, it's a throne. Anyone, if you ever want to change anything, this is what's needed. Give it up. Give up authority. And I love how the Bible actually personifies wisdom. And you ready for this one, ladies? It personifies it as a woman. Hey. Hey, girl, hey. I love this. And you find it a lot in Proverbs, but this is the one proverb I want to read today. Proverbs 4, 6 to 7. It won't be up on the screen, but it says this. If you love wisdom and don't reject her, she will watch over you. I love how the Bible personifies wisdom because we should treat it as though it's, I'm not wise by myself. I'm a knucklehead. I, 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 don't, I don't get it. Sometimes there's no wonder why he tells the disciples, go out and the Holy Spirit's going to tell you what to say. And at times, if I'm honest, like I'm not the smartest guy out there, but the Holy Spirit speaks through me, thank God. Because <laughs> I'm not wise. But it personifies wisdom, and this is what we have to do. We have to give up our authority to her sometimes. To say, I want to do this, but wisdom, what do you want to do? God, I want to do X, Y, and Z, but I'm going to choose you. And again, the ultimate release of control we see in the Garden of Eden where Jesus says, not my will, but yours be done. And if you open up your eyes to that releasing of authority, he does it quite often. Worship team, you could come up. If you remember the Lord's Prayer, you could all stand right now. You, you, if you remember the Lord's Prayer, let me see where are my ex-Catholics in the house. How's this start? It says, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let's stop right there. Notice the language of releasing authority. Our Father, authority, who is in heaven, way above the earth, authority. 
Holy is your name. I'm not holy. You're holy. Authority. Thy kingdom, you're the king. Thy will be done. So even in this small kingdom of me, myself, and I, I'm giving up my will. Again, releasing authority on earth as it already is in heaven. In other words, your authority even in the future. Come on. In, in the beginning of the example, when Jesus said, let's pray like this, he says, before we pray anything, release authority, and then we will bear the fruit of self-control. If there is something you want to change today, and I'm not saying maybe you're not there yet, maybe you're not at a place where you want to change something, but I, if I'm a betting man, I know at least 95% of the people in this room, you want to change something in your life. You cannot do it on your own. I tried. You cannot do it on your own. You have to release the authority and make sure your heart is a throne and not a couch. You can't co-pilot this thing. You have to give it up to the Holy Spirit. You have to give it up to God, and you will bear not just a little bit of fruit, because we serve such a big God, you will bear much fruit. And that fruit's going to be love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, and the most important thing this morning is self-control. Amen?